This is workshop 3017, which I am saying for the benefit of the recording that's being made of this. We are also videotaping this workshop, um, so it should show up on UUA.org sometime before the end of summer, hopefully sooner than that. Uh, and yesterday's uh, Radical Relationships 1, the Science of Covenant, was also videotaped and recorded. So if you weren't able to make that one, um, that'll be made available later on. So welcome everyone, my name is Renee Rohutsky. I am joined by my colleagues, Gina Lise Doran Adams and Doug Zelensky in the back who are handing out pennies, which you'll find out about in just a moment. Um, if you don't have a penny, uh, we'll, at, we'll um, have you raise your hand in a minute, but you should have a, we're gonna be using those pretty quickly. So um, one of the questions that I ask myself and was also asked by theologian Henry Nelson Wyman is how can we be truly religious beings in this world? So how can we be meaning makers? How can we connect with that which is greater than ourselves? And so this workshop is going to help answer that question. For those of you who need something a little bit more tangible and less cerebral, um, here's some of the goals for today's workshop. I, this is basically a connecting of dots between some different concepts. Um, the first concept is congregational polity, everyone's favorite, right? The second is covenant. There's not a surprise since that's part of our, our theme for this General Assembly. Um, and then there's also process theology, and there's going to be a lot of process theology um, involved with this. And then also your very own experiences. So we hope to have some experiential parts, which is part of what the penny, where the pennies are going to come in. So that's our connecting the dots. <laughs> so does anyone not have a penny who needs one? Okay, oh, we did a good job getting you all pennies. And some people actually gave us pennies back, so we appreciate that attitude of generosity that we have in the room. So what I want you to do is, um, you don't even have to stand up necessarily for this, but I want you to find someone close to you and exchange pennies with that person. For those of you with good eyes, you might notice what the date is. There's a couple of Canadian pennies in the mix. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, now what I want you to do with that same person, I want you to speak with them for a couple of minutes and each share what is your favorite hymn that you like to have during the Sunday service or the worship service? What's the hymn that moves you the most and why is that? And I'll give you about a minute and a half and then I'll have you switch. So what was the difference in the experience? And what I'm going to have you do is just maybe share a few things and I'll repeat them for the benefit of the, the recording. So what was the difference that you had in that experience? Between the, the experiences of sharing the hymns and the experience of exchanging pennies. Sorry. Important, important detail there, right? Okay. So what was the difference between the two experiences of, sh of ch exchanging a penny or sharing the story. So one was transactional and one was more relational. There was a story involved with one, okay, with the, with the, the him share. Other. So you got, you got to find out where the person was from. Yes. It didn't matter what the penny said, it was still just a penny. One more? Yes. The, the exchange about the hymn was um, a revelation. We had to reveal something about ourselves, whereas the penny exchange required nothing else. Okay, so the, the telling about the hymn, you had to reveal something about yourself. So there was a revelation involved. Excellent. Okay, one, one, one more, one more.
Okay. <laughs> okay, so you chit-chatted as you exchanged pennies, so that also is relational. Excellent. So there's this um, quote from the founder of Sin Odd Khan. I have no idea what the company does, but this is a great quote. I met a man with a dollar, we exchanged dollars, and we still had one dollar. I'm UUA staff, so you got a penny instead. <laughs> <laughs> That's sa saving your, saving your, um, your annual pro program fund dollars, right? Um, then I met a man with an idea, we exchanged ideas, and now we have two ideas. So the idea of this interchange is this exponential experience. As we encounter someone and learn something about them or learn a new fact, we are con constantly enriching ourselves exponentially. So what happens when you have a whole group of people that exchange ideas? So you just had a one-on-one -on -one encounter. So what happens when you um, you know, talk in a small group like some of you did for your uh, reflection groups today, or you have a conversation in one of your adult religious education classes, the whole group becomes more and more enriched as a whole, as well as each individual becoming enriched. So I, um, there's this great uh, image. I don't know if any of you remember this. George, George Takei, uh, the st guy on Star Trek, Lieutenant Sulu on Star Trek, he's an internet sensation. And he had a, a meme. A meme is an idea or a thought that gains traction and just spreads like wildfire. Wild so he had this, this graphic that he put on Twitter and on Facebook. And it, it's one of those things that just caught fire and, and moved throughout the whole world. And somebody actually came up with a video representation of what that looked like. And I think it's a really powerful um, example of how one idea or one thought, or in this case, one kind of funny graphic, can expand exponentially. It's got a fractal kind of quality to it. So what I love about this and what the, what the internet has been able to do for us, it, it's, um, in some ways it tracks how we interact with each other, but does it at such a lightning speed and with the ability to measure or, pay or know how something is spreading, it's giving us a chance to reflect on how we interact with one another. But of course, you know, we in our congregations usually interact in small groups, one-on-one. -on -one. It's a little bit different, different um, kind of thing. That, although sometimes email works the same way, right? Especially when there's something a little bit controversial happening at a church. Things can, can spread like that. So I want to, this is, this is the part where I pull a connection to congregational polity. So... Um, <coughs> How many of you are familiar with uh, Alice Blair Wesley's men's lectures that um, she did a, f uh, a few years ago? She tells the story of Dedham, Massachusetts. And I love this story. It's a great example of what covenant is about and how it connects with our congregational polity. So this is the part, if you need that after lunch nap, because we're talking about polity, this is a good time. I'll, I'll make a loud noise to wake you up afterward. But... <laughs> The, um, there was a group of, of Puritans that decided to settle in a new place in Dedham, Massachusetts. And um, some came from England, some were from other communities. And they were coming together in pretty much this intentional community. So the first thing they did was sort of divide the land and decide you know, whose cows are going to go where and that sort of thing. And then they decided, okay, how are we going to be together as a church community? Or as a, as a well, in the, those days, church and the, you know, the town were all one body of, of people. So how are they going to be together? So what they did is they scheduled meetings um, every Thursday night where, for a year, and they all got together and, and met to discuss how they were going to be together. 
So um, they had some rules. Uh, the first rule is that they would decide before leaving each meeting what question to discuss next week. So that way people were more apt to share considered thoughts. Each week the host of the, the <coughs> gathering, so who, whose ever home it was in, would begin and speak only to the agreed upon question and then everyone else could speak by turns. And then each one could either choose to speak to that question or a closely related question. Um, and if they wanted to state any objections or doubts concerning what anyone else said, they were to do so humbly and with a teachable heart, not with any mind of caviling or, contradic or contradicting. In other words, they were supposed to speak their own understandings or doubts. They weren't supposed to argue or nitpick. The other thing that I think is really interesting about what they did, which, and I think is instructive for us today, is they didn't talk about dogma or creed. They talked about how they were going to be in community together. And they also decided that their highest value was love. And if you're familiar with their covenant, it begins with love is the doctrine of this church and service is its law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the, that's the story of Dedham. So we still have this, this basic idea. This, is, you know, this process is based on the idea that um, they believed that the will of God and the interpretation of the Bible was best determined by a group of people who gathered together in intentional community. Um, there was no bishops, no popes, no presbyteries, just the people gathered together with their promises to one another and to their highest value, which is love. And I think that's still true of, of you know, that's in our Unitarian Universalist DNA. We may not say the word God anymore, but we do have our highest values, um, our core values that we talk about. Those of you who've done mission work recently, um, those core values are embedded in your mission. And how we serve our mission is we're really serving that which is greater even than our congregation or mission. It's pointing to something else. So, um, so even though we don't have the same theological understanding that, that our Puritan forebears did, we still believe that the process of discernment, this coming together in small groups and talking, or in large groups in the case of GA and, and, and talking, is really core to, to who we are. And if you, um, this is a, a commission on appraisal report from several years ago. A, a new one just came out on um, power and authority, I believe. Uh, but in this one, there was this, this phrase that I thought was really, um, you know, this is 2005, there, the, this phrase, we deepen our wisdom in community when we share our stories and engage in dialogue across our differences. It was highly important to 82% of our lay folk and 91% of our ministers. That's a pretty amazing percentage when you think of it for th this is a core value that we have. So I see this as you know, being sort of a connecting the dot between the, the folks at Dedham and how we are today. So um, what I want to do now is bring us forward to the 20, well, at least the 20th century. I'm not quite ready to go to the 21st century. But talk about how our current um, liberal theological understandings and, and um, basically in process theology, how we can connect the dots between this, our polity and this idea of covenant, which I'll get to later, um, and modern process theology. So um, Doug yesterday in the Science of Covenant alluded to particle physics and this, the idea of fractals and the idea of, of potentials and probabilities and um, the idea that if, if something happens here, it can affect, you know, just what, paying attention to something can change how it, how it acts and reacts. So there's this, th these notions around, which are pretty mystical, really. I mean, you know, even the scientists say that. You know, we don't really understand it. We're observing it. We're trying to make sense of it. But in our human relationships, there's, there's a similar kind of, of um, amazing, like, how did that happen? Uh, those moments of, of synergy or uh, 
synchronicity that we experience that we don't, you know, we have words for them, but we really don't have a, a good understanding of them. So this is where good old process theology comes in. And I, um, I chose this image because uh, Henry Nelson Wyman was called a Unitarian of the third person, where he didn't believe in God the Father or Jesus, but he did believe in the Holy Spirit. So um, I, I find that useful language for myself. So Wyman said that the process of creative interpersonal encounter is the source of human good. So for me, I hear this or I read this, and I, it's the gathered people coming together, interacting in this creative interchange is how we discern the will of God, how, how we make choices toward the good, toward the beloved community, toward, toward the aspirations that we have as religious people. And how does this happen? So yesterday we talked a little bit about the brain and the, the gap and the synapses and things like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull us into the, the philosophy of things. So those of you who have that liberal arts education, you can dust off that diploma and, and use, it, use it this afternoon. So William James, um, he was part of the American pragmatism school of philosophy, had a, a model of how he described human experience and he described perchings and flights. So we have states where we're settled. We, we've, um, we're who we are, we're, we're not really learning anything. We have this, this settled state of being. Maybe that the synapses are not firing during those moments. And then we have flights. So the times when we're unsettled, where we're in the process of becoming, uh, where we're um, between where, who we were and who we're yet to become. There's that, that unsettled state. So, um, and that happens as you're talking to someone else or as you're experiencing something. Or um, I, I'm thinking I learned how to drive a stick shift fairly late in life, and I was very unsettled. Um, I'd have nightmares about not being able to get places and things like that. So, and now, of course, I, I can do it totally automatically. I don't even think about it. But there's that that experience we have of the learning of the engaging, and then it becomes part of who we are, and we don't even have to think about it anymore. And of course, the interesting part is the stuff that happens during the flight, what, the, the becoming part. It's, it's a little bit unsettling, but it's also where the excitement is. It's where the energy happens. And, you know, we... Um, Part of the idea of creative interchange among humans is that we're already in, you know, very rich, dynamic, complicated creatures. So when we interact with one another, um, it's a you know, it's one thing like looking up um, an answer on Google, for example, and having a conversation with somebody. It's just a richer experience. So Wyman described God as the creative event. Um, it's, this, it's the moment when something is in the process of becoming and there's a feeling of interconnectedness between what's happening in the moment, what um, is about to happen or the potential of what can happen, and all the things that happened in the past. So I think of um, when, I, when I learn something from someone, there's sort of a, a lineage of where the ideas come from. So I'm, not only am I connected to the person I'm learning something from, I'm learning from their teachers and their teachers. So all of their experience, now um, I encounter that and it becomes a part of me in some way. Maybe not as, as um, bright as in where the person who has that, ex you know, the person I'm learning from, it's not gonna be quite as rich as that, but it enriches me and it interacts with all my other experiences. Um, one example I'm thinking of is um, when I was in seminary and taking classes, it was really interesting how I'd be, you know, doing reading for three or four different courses at the same time, and I'd be connecting the dots between, oh, this goes with this, and this goes with this, and I realized, you know, if I took three different classes, you know, like the same class with two other classes, my experience would be way different. And that's, and in our congregations that happens as well. You know, every time a new person walks in the door, there's this, 
this shift that happens in, in the group, and there's an enrichment that happens. And if that person is, you know, if we're all kind of the same, there's one experience, but if there's a, a real difference and we're really engaging in that deep sort of way, we're really enriching the community in a really deep and significant way. So some of the things that you need to um, make space for this creative event, to make space for us to um, encounter one another with this kind of ability to encounter and incorporate richness is human freedom and agency. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, creative commons stuff. When I, when I create things, I sort of put it out in the universe and hope other people use it. Um, I, I always feel like it's a, a bad idea to have an idea and hold on to it. It, it gets stale. Uh, I like the idea of, of sharing and sharing information. When, when information's free-flowing, it always feels better than if there's a secret or somebody's holding back something. It just it, it adds a whole different um, uh, tenor to the relationship. Uh, the other thing is sacred inspiration. Um, I, I think of this... Dewey, uh, John Dewey and Wyman both described this as kind of a lure to the good. So there's something in our humanity where we, we sort of know what's right and what's wrong. And our, our religious institutions that we create or our spiritual practices help to reinforce us um, to choose uh, good or the, the better over something that is hurtful. So we, we kind of have this hardwired into us. And... Um, part of when I think of this as a religious understanding the, the process theology bit of this is that we we're making space to invite again using theological language to invite God in to invite the spirit in to um, yesterday someone talked about you know uh, some Christian youth groups pray before they, they meet and how it changes the, the feeling of the, the meeting. And I know some boards have practices where they have an inspirational reading or a moment of silence and they remind themselves of maybe their mission. So there's something about reconnecting to that which is greater than ourselves and why we're here together for that, um, that thing that is greater than the sum of all of us, whatever that might be. And then the next part is integration. So as we're, as we're encountering one another, while we have in mind and in our practices these, these sacred aspirations, then we pull that into ourselves. And then that becomes part of us. And we're enriched going forward. So back, and then, you, and then you're, you know, you're going on to the next flight. So you're in that settled state, and then you're encountering the next thing, the next experience. And there's times, you know, when I've just had too many flights lately, and I just want to perch for a while, right? <laughs> but, but, you know, part of what, when we talk about encouragement to spiritual growth, we're saying, hey, you know, let's jump off and, and fly around for a bit. Let's be uncomfortable. Let's be unsettled. Um, I want to go back to this idea of diversity. So the other thing that Wyman talked about is the more diverse your ideas are and the communities are, the more enriched the, the group becomes, the more enriched each individual becomes, and the more enriched the group becomes. And for me, um, this is my theological foundation for why I'm so committed to intercultural competency, um, making our congregations multicultural, multi-generational, because each person has a gift that they can bring into the community. And the more diverse those folks are, the more we make space for the folks at the edges, the outliers, the, the more creativity that can be part of the, con the congregation and the community. There's also that, um, we, we did an exercise yesterday with Jean Elise, but this opening, so, you know, a lot of spiritual, you know, the, we talked about it, let's quiet the brain through a physiological um, model yesterday, but most religions um, have some sort of spiritual practice which quiets and then opens. So for those of you, um, I practice yoga, and we always talk about opening, opening the heart chakra, opening, um, opening your own attention 
being fully present. So this is an important, so in our, in our churches we do this, right? We have um, joys and concerns where we open our hearts to specific events in people's lives. We ha- some of us have moments of silence. Uh, music can open, it can open joy, it can open our um, sorrow. There are lots of ways that we can, we can provide opportunities to open and be fully present with one another. So helping, helping to hold all this is our own spiritual practice, our group spiritual practice of covenant. And I like to think of covenant as a container to help hold the space where this creative interchange can happen. So we talk about behavioral covenants, and we were, when we were discussing and planning this workshop, we t- joked about how it's like flight attendants on the plane. There are just certain things you, can, you sh- need to do and you need to not do to make it work. So they give us the, you know, the instructions on the plane, no smoking in the bathrooms, put on your seatbelt, um, don't move around the cabin unless the, the seatbelt lights off, those sorts of things. But we also have our aspirational covenants. So what is it? You know, we're gathered as religious communities. Um, Hopefully, it's for a reason to make a difference in the world, not only to help ourselves, but to help the world be a better place. So what is that aspirational piece? What is our faith, our, our religion calling us to do? And how do we articulate that? So this is the little diagram thing. I was an engineer in my first career, so I have to draw everything out in a a diagram. So this is my my understanding of um, process theology and covenant. It's a very similar process, at least in my head. So what I'm doing today is sharing this model that I work with, and it might be useful for you. So this is not... um, the theology for the the 21st century necessarily, but I'm hoping that you'll find it useful. So this is another way of talking about perches and flights. We have our self. um, We have who you are in this moment, especially if you're feeling settled and, you know, maybe just woke up from your post-lunch nap. Um, And then something happens. There's something that interrupts your, your settledness. And what happens is you process that. You um, use past experiences, and then you also use your intellect, your frontal cortex, to, um, to think about it. If it's a problem, you, know, you solve the problem. You know, I love problems. You know. Oh, you know, again, the engineer in me comes out. It's like, oh, you know, I've got this you know, connector and this uh, plug, and I need to figure out how to get the two to work together. What can I do? So... There's, a, there's a, a problem or an idea, something that doesn't quite compute with you, and you, you engage with that. And once you've done that and you, you know, go from the integration into pulling it into yourself, that becomes a part of your new self. You're, you're the same person, but then you have this new experience and this new um, additional way of being in the world. So what happens in community, there's other folks having the same things happening to them. And when we interact with one another, that unsettledness, our conversations, our discussions, our arguments, become this interaction, this unsettledness that we do for one another. And, you know, that can be a really great experience. It can be a really awful experience. But it does change us. And it rewires our brain, as we were talking about yesterday. So in our congregations, and these are words that... um, Alice Blair Wesley uses and when she talks about covenant. I just think they're, they're sort of, at least the forebearance is kind of an old-fashioned word, but I think of them as being really useful. To really keep the discussion, the discourse, the interaction free and open. Um, you know, you want the free will, you want the openness. You need two things. One is you need this sense of goodwill, that you're all here for the same reason. You all have shared commitments, you have shared values. Um, there's trust with one another. And then also forbearance, which is um, kind of knowing what baggage is your baggage and what baggage isn't. And uh, you might call it emotional intelligence. You might call it spiritual maturity. It's maybe a little bit of all of it. But really um, providing an opportunity to, or or 
having a sense of self, self-differentiation, there's lots of words for that. And you know, you need those two things to really keep the discourse open. So I think of covenant as providing a container where this happens. The, the goodwill may be our mission, uh, our promises to one another, our covenants to one another, our behavioral covenants, how we're going to be with one another. It's not okay to yell at me and call me names when you disagree with me. Um, the covenant may need to articulate that. How am I doing time-wise? We're great. Okay. Um, one, one thing I was uh, thinking of recently, and this may or may not resonate with you, but part of what happened, I think, when, when the 60s happened is we lost a little, th there were so many rules, you know, of, of behavior. I remember, like, there was charm school when I was growing up to teach you. Anybody remember charm school? Yeah. It's like, whatever happened to charm school? But there, there, were, there were things in society that we had that reinforced certain standards of behavior. And they were very stifling, right? But they also served a purpose. And I think, I think part of why we've gone back to behavioral covenants is that some of the purpose that they served, we lost you know, that, that, um, that politeness of interacting with one another. So anyway, that was sort of an aside. So the other thing about covenant, and this is something that um, my conversations with, with Doug and Gina Lise, you know, when we talk about covenant, we're not just talking about this container. There's some other things embedded in that. Um, one is, you know, our basic core religious values, uh, our understanding of the purpose of religion. Are we, you know, we, we uh, say things like, are we a country club or are we a faith community? You know, but even beyond that, what is our purpose? What is our mission in the world? Um, our understandings about our relationships and uh, lines of accountability with one another. Uh, the power of association. You're all here at General Assembly, so you know that there's other Unitarian Universalists in the world, but how do we be in relationship with them? So these are all bits and pieces of, um, of what we think of when we talk about covenant, at least. And then the other bit, and this is the piece that we didn't have yesterday with the science, is that what is our vow with the universe? So w as a religious community, what is it that, that, what's our purpose? What do we promise to the world around us? And the small groups will be talking a little bit about that um, tomorrow for the topic. And when we think of the vow of the universe, we also talk about, you know, that's embodied in we want to see transformation with not only within our congregations, but beyond our congregations. So I like to think of my own home church as a place where we train people to learn how to work the system so they can go out and do things like serve on city council, uh, make our local food co-op well-functioning, uh, all sorts of things like that. You know, there's, that's one thing we can do. We you know, do a lot of advocacy stuff. So there's, a, there's a lot of things that can be with the, in that transformation piece. And um, this vow with the universe, I think of that as being articulated in our mission statements and our vision statements. You know, they're, they're limiting statements, but they point to something that's greater than the statement, that somewhere about our, our aspirational values, who we want to be in the world and how we want the world to be. So our vision of, of our place in the universe and how we can um, aspire to that and make choices that head us in that direction. Another way of thinking about this, I just took a training with um, Beth Zemsky and Phyllis Braxton. They're part of One UMA Consulting. They've been working with our ministers on a, a program called Who Are Our Neighbors? And we're hoping to also roll that out um, for lay people around the country as well. But there's this notion of, of creating shared meaning. And those of us who've done um, some multicultural work, there's this, this notion of um, white privilege or you know, different kinds of privilege. And part of a practice that we can aspire to is how do we, under, how do we create communities where we create a shared meaning around things? It's a, um, it's a whole other workshop maybe, but for those of you who have this language already, there's enough, that's another way of thinking about this whole creative interchange is creating that shared meeting for the community. 
And again, going back to the diversity piece, the more, if we were creating shared meeting with people, with, with one another, we make more space for diversity, and that diversity in turn leads, for more, leads to more enrichment. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Gina Lise, and she has an exercise for us to experience this. It'll get us over that afternoon slump for a bit. So one of the, the practices of covenant, and I believe one of the exciting paradigm shifts that we're moving into is a world of individualism to a world of collectivism. And I found this by accident one day when I was talking about the interdependent web of existence, and I wrote the initials, and I looked at it, and it went, I, we. I, web of existence. And I realized that this is, I know, I was just as shocked when I saw it, too. I wish I had been that brilliant to think it up. But, but it just really dawned on me how, how our culture has prioritized autonomy and individuality. Part of covenant is making a promise and at times actually surrendering my agenda to someone else or to something larger. And so one of the things that um, I've played with throughout time is interplay. And one of the things that they've discovered are the five movements of leading. And we're going to go through them in a minute. But if you're going to be a good leader in shared power and authority to attain a committed mission, there are practices that we need to en engage in when we're leading. A part of it is initiation. So you have the capacity to lead and to start something. Leaders also need followers. And so we can ecstatically follow a leader that's taking us in a direction that may be calling us to learn new things. And then there's a, a moment in that where there's an integration between the leading and the following where we actually create a mass movement. I think about the, the, um, a moment last year at GA with those thousands of people waving their candles in the sky at Tent City. And there was just something that kind of transformed the entire crowd, that moment of possibility. And then all things come to an end. And we need to know when to stop something. Maybe that strategy for that vision is no longer needed and we need a new one. So we, know, we need to know how to end something. And we need to come back to ourselves and then to re-engage in connection. So I'm going to invite you into having an experience of these movements. And this is going to be a little challenging. I'm so delighted we have so many people in the room. And this actually works so much better if we had a whole ball field to play on. So we may have to wind it down just a little bit. But if you can, go find a partner anywhere in the room. And Renee, I'm going to invite you to come and play with me. So I want you to just put your palm to your partner's palm and just greet your partner or the back of your hand or your elbow. I mean, remember, this is about creativity and engagement, so you may engage in new ways, all right? So find a way to just connect with your partner hand to hand in any way that's comfortable for you and just take a look at your partner, give them a little push, let them know that you're there. Hi, I'm here. And just gently taking care of your own body, take your partner's wrist and just sort of give them a little tug and just notice how much you can rely on them. I mean, you can get really creative with this and turn and play and just notice. And then come back together again with a connection. Decide which of you is going to be partner A and which of you is going to be partner B? And you're both going to get a turn, so it's okay. All right. So there are a variety of ways in which you can do this. You can move smooth and slow with your partner. Not yet. I'll tell you that. I'm giving you options for those of you who haven't played this game before. 
So, and you can kind of trick your partner and tease them and do that, you know, sort of in flight and sort of, you know, bring in your little devilish twin and, and change with it and connect in new ways with your partner. And maybe you even move off your spot a little bit and just, you know, dance with your partner. You may even find a new partner group later on. Not yet. So, and, and make it up. There are actually no rules to this exercise. Okay? Partner A, partner A, you are going to initiate and lead any way you choose. And partner B's only job is to follow ecstatically. <laughs> ecstatically. There we go. And if another hand or elbow wants to get involved, that's okay. Am I being sufficiently ecstatic? And bring yourself to a point of stillness and switch. Partner B is now going to lead, and partner A is going to ecstatically follow. And you can get your whole body involved. Oh, I love it. People are playing. And find another moment of stillness. And without deciding, both follow and lead. Without deciding who is doing the following or leading. And switch periodically. Sometimes it's helpful if you close your eyes. <laughs> it's still okay to laugh and have fun. Got so serious about this. I mean, how are we going to do this without deciding? And begin to find a point of stillness and still connected to your partner. Drop your hand or hands and step just a ways away. And still if you can feel connected to your partner but separated. And then completely drop your connection with your partner and come back to yourself. Your own two feet your own spirit, your own heart, your own connection, your own. Greet your partner again, and the dance begins in a new project, a new idea, a new whatever. Find a way to thank your partner and find a seat.
So I love the buzz that this creates, and I never know whether you got excited about the exercise or if you're just happy to finally move and exercise again. <laughs> a little of both, a little of both. So I hope that our work and our mission and our covenants and our promises together can incorporate more engaged and embodied work and more connection. What did you notice during that exercise? And I'm going to invite you to the mic so that everyone in the room can hear. What did you notice about when you were leading or following? What did you notice? Some of us prefer one or the other. I noticed that I was looking at Charlie's eyes and, and watching his expressions a lot, and that was really nice. So part of our work in Covenant is how to connect, how to connect with others that are different than us, and to notice what's happening inside of ourselves as we're making that connection. I noticed how smoothly the transition went from leading to following, and it was just felt instinctive and very safe. Very safe. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of laughter going on with my partner. And uh, but when we got to the part of integration and, you, and everybody in the room kind of hushed down, it was because I realized I was really concentrating on listening to her with the body of like, okay, is she leading? What if I try this? And you know, it was very interesting to realize that that took a lot of concentration too. I realized that when we did the uh, the one where we didn't know who was leading or who was following, we had to slow down. And it struck me that when I negotiate, I have to slow down. Yeah. What she said. Okay. I love it. There's a statically following for you. Give her a hand. <laughs> and for those of us that are, are used to leading, oh, the relief sometimes in a statically following. Uh, I noticed how quickly we became intimate and connected, just um, unexpectedly, just and immediately, just a beautiful connection and warmth. Thank you. I related it to a dance. A dance, that wonderful cosmic dance. I noticed how difficult it was to disengage, that even when I turned away, I still felt connected and engaged. It was almost impossible to not feel engaged at all. Am I allowed to comment? Absolutely. <laughs> Can you still feel it? Yes. yes. Is that room for one more? Absolutely. Uh, I, I found that um, I was doing things that I would not ordinarily choose to do wow. because I was doing it in conjunction with somebody else. So what might this tell you about theology or making room for the creative encounter and sharing power and authority and leadership in new ways guided by promises and mission and ministry. What did you learn? If you can come to the mic or shout really loud, I will, I'll repeat. I know it's hard to get to the mic for some of you. It occurs to me that one of the problems with UU is that we're so individualistic and so many humanists, atheists, agnostics, and so on, that it's, uh, we always apologize when we say the word God. And yet, I noticed with dog training and other things, a dog needs a master. I think people need something larger than themselves. And so it occurs to me that covenant is a nice neutral word for I think we need God whether, God, whether God exists or not. I think we need something larger than ourselves, and I think that covenant is a, a neutral word that we can use for that which is bigger than ourselves. Thank you. I felt that one of the things that was very unusual about this was that we were touching, and how often in our regular contacts with other people do we move away from touching? Are we afraid of touching? Because this is so fundamental uh, that we need to perhaps begin 
figuring out tricks to get us to touch each other somehow as part of a process of becoming engaged about something that may be un unrelated to whatever it is we're touching about. For me, it was just a sense of establishing a rhythm. And it's sort of the rhythm of life that you're, that you're finding together. That spirit of playfulness and, and just seeing what arises. I found, and, and reflecting on it at the end, um, it reminds me of really good committee work yes. where yes. you don't even bother to take votes. Everybody discusses, and eventually you come to consensus mm -hmm. with everybody yielding, uh, yielding a little bit and not even thinking about, hey, we haven't voted on this. And, and uh, can I ask you a question? Yeah. When that happens, what changes in the room? Do you notice anything? There's a good feeling. Yeah. There's a good, if you find the, the, rather than the meeting ending with uh, somebody saying something to, to the side of somebody else, there's a general feeling of comradeship that, 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 that you get, you know, when it comes to that, that everybody, everybody's given a little bit and, it hasn't been, I want to dominate or not. It is, let's make it all work together. I always feel a bit, um, what's the word, humbled by that experience. There's just something magical that sort of arises out of that commitment. Something that none of us may have thought of when we walked in the room, but our engagement together and our conversations and promises together just allow for something unexpected to happen. One more? I thought it was really important that at the beginning, we each consciously took the role of being the leader and then being the follower. And then we were able to move into a space where we could switch easily back and forth between those roles. Mm -hmm. That's great. Renee? So I just wanted to pull this model back up and, and again, connect the dots between your experience that, um, that you all had and this idea of creative interchange. Um, again, you know, yourself, your, your interactions with one another, um, the goodwill that you had to have to do that. You sort of tested it, right? Um, Gina Lee's had you pull and, and resist a little bit, so there was a testing that happened. The relationship and accountability piece, being really clear about that, um, with you know who's leading, who's following, then you could sort of relax into that that more fluid interchange. Um, so now I just wanted to pull pull this back in to connect the dot, and then I think I have my colleague Doug. Take a minute and look at those and, and, and see if you can discern the radical part of this. So in, in our congregations, we know that the, the principle about our, our free and responsible search for truth and meaning we tend to interpret that as an individual search, right? Yeah, an individual search. Do we ever check in with each other about that search, by the way? How's your search going? <laughs> okay, laugh now, but really, how, well, how's your search going? What kind of truths are you finding? All right, what makes us a community, a congregation, is covenant 
because that's the vessel in which we bring our individual truths to bear collectively that wisdom on our mission, on our purpose. So the, the, the person who talked about covenant being a neutral, f neutral word, by the way, it's not neutral in some other congregations, but uh, I understand exactly what you mean, and, and I hope that this, this is another way of looking at it, which is covenant is the holding ground for us to bring our individual truths and the wisdom we've gained from our searches into uh, a place to motivate and create love in the world. How do we do that? You bring your Buddhist perspective to our conversation about mission. You bring your atheist perspective about to our congregation to, to our conversation about how to shape the world. How what is our congregation going to do to shape the world in love? And what have we done as a community then? We have reflected and had the kind of dialogue we hope the world could do, right? We are modeling our hope for the world and the microcosm of how we bring together our individual religious beliefs or non-beliefs into a covenanted space to dialogue about how do we move forward as a community to shape the world in love. That's the purpose, that's the binding agent for our congregations. Religion is bind, includes the concept of binding, and we don't have fear to bind us, we don't have dogma to bind us, we don't have hierarchy to bind us. We've chosen this, reflected through congregational polity, to bind us together. That turns us uh, that turns us from an I to a we around the most passionate thing we often have in our lives, our personal beliefs. We've taken the most challenging, passionate place and said, we can do this and we can, we can, do, we can, we can mesh ourselves together. And covenant is the thing that does that for us. I, I, I tell people this, and actually I mean it, and they're kind of surprised when they realize I mean it. If your congregation isn't operating in covenant, it's not a UU congregation. Covenant is fundamental to what it means to be Unitarian Universalist. What we're discovering now that's radical, and, and it wasn't as radical as, as it might be for all of us, is that when we op what we're asking when we operate in covenant is to change our brains. So when you have aha moments, the, the first part of, of this, part one, was really about when is covenant as opposed to what is covenant. Now, we spend a lot of time on the instantaneous moment when you can feel covenant being in the room and what kind of choice you're going to make around that moment, which science backs up as a real place where neurons are waiting to be either shunted one way or shunted another way. And if you choose the new way, the brain will support you and plant a neural pathway there. And if you do it again, it'll strengthen that neural pathway. And the old one, the old pathway you've chosen not to follow, diminishes in power. And eventually, we don't know if it disappears, but it certainly loses its dominance in, in that kind of situation. So science is literally supporting this notion that when we have our aha, aha moments, our brain is, is organizing itself around how to support the revelations we're having. And, cov and covenant is the place where we, in a sense, share our brain and redirect the, the neurons of our congregation into a brain of mission. Sorry. Shared leadership power with rather than power over, sorry. This is where, again, what we model for the world is that congregational polity, oh sorry, congregational polity in the sense that a, a voluntary group of people who don't have to come together have given money how many people show up for more than Sunday service? 
at their congregation. You give a precious resource, more precious than money, which is your time, and it's based entirely on the fact that you all have promised to do this. The people who show up at your committee meeting that goes well, why should they be there? Because they know that you'll be there, because they know the work that we're doing, you're doing is important. And that's entirely self-organized and voluntary. Yes, you've got a governance structure, but it was put together by folks who were volunteers. Yes, you have a staff, but it was put together and it's, it's uh, directed, guided by folks who voluntarily come together. And when you voluntarily come together, you are saying, gee, there must be something bigger for us to do together than individually. And so we are bringing together the power that we share and, and presenting that to the world and using it to change the world rather than what the kind of power we would assert over each other or over the rest of the world as we move. And this has something to do with how we would move into community. So I would also say that a congregation that is not operating in association is not a Unitarian Universalist congregation. And, and we think of association as the UUA, which is, is us, by the way. But association is what you do with your neighbor, neighboring congregation because they have delegates too, and they, that means they're actually part of the UUA. Actually, you guys are the UUA. And so association is actually how we bring covenant outward into community. It's the way we take this important thing around how we hold ourselves together and begin to expand it into something that goes bigger than ourselves. We start with our congregations. We've agreed to an associational covenant around our conversations, our, our congregations. We hope that that kind of relationship expands beyond our congregations. Other religious liberal organizations. Okay, and then it goes on beyond that. And so what we're, in, in doing that, we are at least in our thought experiment saying, this vessel is strong enough to hold. And do you know what the vessel relies on in a volunteer organization? Making a promise and keeping it. Or it also relies on making a promise and breaking it and coming back. And in fact, half the most powerful stuff that happens in relationship is when we fail and figure out how to come back into covenant. If you have a covenant that nobody breaks, you didn't need a covenant, right? Everybody already knows the rules. We're already following the rules. We're just kind of repeating what we know how to do already. So breaking covenant means you've aspired to more than you, than, than you knew you could do when you made that, and, are, and it's by breaking and rejoining that you learn, oh, that's how I be more than I said I wanted to be. Do other folks have ways in which their experience or they see this as radical? As a special education teacher in high school for a number of years, <laughs> I found that the most powerful thing that I could do was to pass the teaching responsibility to my students so that they began to recover the self-confidence they had lost as a result of their schooling experience up to that point. Thank you. Anything else? Are, are there ways in which you, that we haven't mentioned already, that you, your experience of, what, of covenant can be radical, is radical, you've discovered might be radical? It's public. 
Oh, wow. Wow, and now we have to end. She said, covenant is public. Do you know what the implications of that are? We have, to, we have to be willing to learn in public, fail in public. For some of us, it's hard to succeed in public. We are risking in public. Oh my gosh, thank you. That's pretty radical. So I don't know if we will be available. I, um, we find that people come up and ask us questions afterwards. So I know folks have places to go and, and things to do. So thank you all for coming and giving us your precious attention. I really appreciate it. And uh, the slides will be available as well as the video. Uh, look for it in about a month or so.